Now back to Inside Real Estate. Here's Mike the Realtor. Hey folks, welcome back to the Inside. Here we go Inside Real Estate Sports Entertainment Politics every Sunday morning. Uh, welcome back to your Sunday morning. Time for politics and entertainment segment. Uh, we've got a very special guest with us. We've got uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Ralph Peters, uh, Fox News contributor and author of many great books. Uh, current book that just came out, The Damned of Petersburg. Um, Colonel, are you on the line with us? I am here, and great to speak with you, Mike. Good to speak with you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, Want to talk about you know a couple things that are going on in the world before we get to the book, and sure. uh, you know read the book cover to cover. By the way, great book. Um, I really wanted to talk to you about Turkey because um, you seem to be one of the very few out there that is kind of out in front on this and and has sort of a perspective that you may or may not be unique, but you're willing to discuss it. And, um, you know, our own, uh, administration has, has really been pretty quiet on it and the media has been kind of quiet on it. And I wonder if you can get into it a little bit and, and, and kind of explain it, it to folks and, you know, and where, you know, Gulen falls into this and, um, you know, where we should be, what side we should be on, et cetera. Well, Turkey is complex, but um, it's a place I, I fell in love with when I went there as a backpacking sergeant in 1979. So my wife and I even took our honeymoon there, a long bus trip up to the Iranian border, um, and staying in some interesting places. So I really know the country firsthand. I've also worked with the Turkish military within NATO. And the, the, you need a little bit of background to understand. When the old Ottoman Empire collapsed at the end of World War I, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, um, a, a, a former Ottoman general, basically saved his country from, from disappearing. And he was, he's a brilliant man, and he knew that Turkey, although Turkey's a Muslim country, but he knew that the way forward was westernization, secularization, modernization. And so Ataturk got rid of the veil, got rid of the fez, uh, separated the church and state, or mosque and state in, in this case, uh, instituted a secular constitution that put the training wheels on the government to lead toward democracy. And and so the military in Turkey, for, for almost a century, has been the guardian of Ataturk's legacy, of secularism, of modernization, of, of separating of mosque and state. Now, the current president of Turkey, President Erdogan, who began as the mayor of Istanbul uh, almost a quarter century ago, He's an Islamist affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, Turkey is a democracy, but Erdogan used, as so many, as so often happens, President Erdogan of Turkey used democracy to come to power. Now that he is in power, he is dismantling democracy. He's ripping apart the secular constitution. He's Islamizing Turkey. He has more journalists in jail than China does. Uh, censorship is rampant. He has phony prosecutions. And the coup uh, appears to have involved uh, um, largely military officers who are trying to rescue their country from Islamization. And there are also people with other agendas, nationalist agendas, who are set about Erdogan's handling of the Kurdish question. Um, But the bottom line is uh, the coup was sort of a last gasp of the old modernizing, secularizing regime. And President Erdogan's base is among the country people, the semi-literate, the slum dwellers, uh, who put Islam first and their, and their country second. So we're seeing in Turkey um, a, a slow-moving coup where Erdogan uh, is destroying democracy and secular government and in ter- making Turkey into an Islamic state. Um, he has betrayed us time and again. He has um, uh, frustrated our attempts to deal with Syria. He's allowed foreign fighters to go through uh, to join ISIS. He cracked down on that about a year ago, but for years he was letting it happen. He backs uh, uh, religious extremists, uh, Islamist extremists in Syria. He just doesn't back al-Qaeda and ISIS because he can't control them. He wants to control the radicals. So basically, President Erdogan is not our friend. He's destroying his country. Um, He's uh, an Islamist, hardcore Muslim Brotherhood guy. 
And the Obama administration doesn't know what to do. And also, President Obama, really, I mean, incredibly, he sees the Muslim Brotherhood as a way forward for the Middle East, as a as a less radical version of uh, as a less radical form of Islam. But the difference between ISIS, Al Qaeda, and the Muslim Brotherhood is really just about table manners. Their goals are all the same: Sharia law, hardcore Islamist regimes. And so I feel, on one hand, the administration has duped itself, and on the other hand, there are issues such as the NATO base at Inderlik, where we we use and we've depended on heavily over the decades. Uh, but there are alternatives to the use of that strategic air base in Turkey. The Kurds in Iraq have wanted to, to give us an air base with no strings uh, for for, de- for decades now. Um, there you can, there's an option of using Cyprus. There are many options. Mm-hmm. But our military, too, can be you, you sort of fall into the pattern of, well, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we're always going to do it. And so Essentially, that NATO base, air base, Inderlik, uh in Turkey has held our, host- our, our foreign policy hostage for a long time. And I just think it's time to, to break with uh, Erdogan, to, to move to suspend Turkey uh, from NATO and to uh, cut, come down hard on the Islamist side. Now, you ask about Gulen, the um, former ally of Erdogan, who had a falling out with him a few years ago. Glenn now lives in the Poconos in eastern Pennsylvania. And he may have had some of his supporters peripherally involved in the coup, but Erdogan is trying to pin the coup on Glenn in order to eliminate his last serious rival. I mean, Glenn's already been driven into exile. He doesn't have much power left at all. His base in Turkey, in Turkey has been dismantled by Erdogan and his thugs. But Erdogan's relentless. He wants Gulen imprisoned, if not executed. And so he's filed this extradition request. Um, well, he's, filed, uh, he, he's requested that Gulen be arrested while they put together the full formal extradition request. But Erdogan is just a bad guy start to finish. And that's as succinct as I can make it. It's a very complex issue. You're right. It is 100 percent complex, but that was that was everything and more I could hope for. I mean, you took us from start to finish, and that that was beautiful, you know. But while we're you know, messing... it's usually women who say that to me that that was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, and that was beautiful. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. You guys just roll with it. Sorry. <laughs> but you know, while we're talking about you know transgender in the bathrooms and race baiting and this, that, and the other. This is largely ignored, but this is a huge issue. Turkey goes Islamist along with much of the rest of the Middle East. Uh, you know, this is huge, but it's just not discussed. I mean, <laughs> why is it why is it so ignored? Well, it's ignored because we don't pay much attention to foreign policy. Uh, we Americans have been blessed by geography. We have oceans between us and and most of our enemies. Um, we live despite. The, the constant stream of uh, frightening headlines, we, most Americans, live in amazing safety and amazing comfort. Um, when, when your na- number one domestic security problem is obesity, you're not doing too badly. Um, so we, we, foreign policy issues don't drive ratings, so they don't get covered. And we do cover foreign policy. It's one issue at a time. It's either going to be the latest crisis with Putin or the latest crisis with ISIS, or the latest crisis with Iran. You know very well, it's, a, it's part of, you know, segments are short. You know, you got to watch the ratings, Peter. Americans don't want too much foreign policy. And we forget in this election year that the, the primary justification for a, 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 a nation's existence is to protect its citizens um, and, and their property. The primary duty of a president is commander-in-chief of the armed forces uh, to protect uh, the security of the United States and its citizens. Those are primary. Instead, we get wrapped around all sorts of interesting but secondary issues. Um, I mean, the the issue of gender in bathrooms can be very frustrating, but if you compare that to the problems we have uh, with Iran or ISIS or Putin, or the potential dangers of Turkey going rogue, um, <laughs> you might as well just have everybody use the, use the field for outside for a latrine or something. But the security <laughs> issues, 
And, 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 you know, we've seen this at least since John F. Kennedy, Mm -hmm. that presidents come to office, right, right, Democrats or Republicans, with a strong domestic agenda they want to, to bring to fruition. And foreign policy eats them alive, whether it's uh, the Bay of Pigs or, or Vietnam or, or foreign oil price shocks in the 70s um, or the rise of terrorism. Um, it's, you know, it just goes on and on and on, and we get sucked into it. And like George Bush, George Bush came to off, George W. Bush, with, with a strong domestic agenda. He wanted to, to work out a modus uh, operandi with Mexico. And it all went south after 9-11 which consumed his presidency. And with Obama, who, again, strong domestic agenda, whether you agree with it or not, and I don't, um, but he, is, he has been the greatest foreign policy failure as president of any president in our history, and that's not hyperbole. So when we've seen this disastrous state of affairs, where often presidents with the best intentions will come to the Oval Office uneducated and disinterested or uninterested in foreign affairs, and foreign affairs eat them alive. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that that's, that may continue to be the case going forward. But I don't want to get into politics. I'll just say this. That history is vengeful, and history refuses to be digested and removed. Um, what we're seeing in the Middle East is Iran, its Persian core, trying to reestablish a new Persian empire of a scope that has not existed for 2,500 years uh, from Iran into East, into Afghanistan, west through Iraq and Syria and Lebanon to the Mediterranean. Erdogan of Turkey dreams of a new Ottoman Empire and a caliphate. That's something I didn't mention. That you know we hear about the ISIS caliphate, but President Erdogan of Turkey also dreams of a caliphate in the old Ottoman Empire, uh, the, for the predecessor of today's Turkey. The Sultan and the Caliph were one and the same. The head of state was also. The, 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 command, the commander of the faithful, the guardian of the faith. And uh, in Saudi Arabia, the, the, the most the Saudi Arab tribes had was the Sharif of Mecca. So history keeps coming back and coming back. And another mm. problem we Americans have is, and it's, in many ways it's good, we're forward-looking. We want to put the past behind us. We want to go ahead, move ahead and not wallow in centuries-old disputes uh, as so much of the world does. But the problem with that is we, we've taken, basically taken history out of our schools. Uh, our, our young people don't even know what century the Civil War was fought in. Uh, you know, sort of like, oh, right. yeah, oh, man, like, yeah, like that's when, like, George Washington bombed Pearl Harbor, right, man? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 I mean really, exactly we're, we're right. historical literates. But unfortunately, many of the problems we have today uh, are, are deeply rooted in history. I mean, you hear all this nonsense about the Crusades, all the Crusades. The Crusades are a little blip on the eastern Mediterranean coast for 200 years. G- Islamist jihad began in the 7th century and never stopped. Right. It went into brief periods of hiatus. It had peaks and valleys. But the jihad we see today is nothing new. It is perceived by not all but many within Islam to be a duty to spread the faith uh, with fire and sword when persuasion doesn't work. So if we would only stop the hyperbole, and if Washington could, could or, or even you know, news shows could sort of separate out some of what I call the experts by virtue of Wikipedia, right. and really look at these issues with some depth, we would have a much more uh, successful foreign policy indeed, because even if we don't like history, uh, history is going to always wrap its arms around us. Yeah, it always shapes where we are, and... You know, if Turkey goes down and slides downhill to the Islamists, you're, you're absolutely right. That entire Ottoman Empire could be reinvented again, and uh, you know, it's it's coming well, back. The Arabs are coming back full it. circle. Um, let me ask you a quick question, and then you know, I want to get to the book because there's so much great stuff in the book. You know, but where are our military leaders, our students of history, as far as options for us in office? Because you know, so many of our great military leaders are amazing students of history, but yet we've got two people, Hillary and Trump, who don't know much about anything. Why do we have to choose between these two? Where are the folks like you that we could actually stand up and say, hey, this guy or this gal really knows what he's talking about? Why can't we have somebody like like y'all running for office? Well, 
my my personal story matches that of a number of other former military officers where I've been approached about running for office, but I will not do it because I'm not a beggar. Um, and to be a politician today, you have to spend about really about two thirds of your time begging for money. Right. And and I, I'm just not going to do that with my life. Uh, I, I come from a, a coal mining background where you didn't take government the government dole, you worked hard, you pay your old bills. I mean, I'm a, from a family of moonshiners and bare knuckles prize fighters, <laughs> um, and and we just we just don't share those values. Now, I believe in public service. I've certainly done my 22 years in the military. I still try to help out our military where I can. But I do view our, in my view, both political parties have failed us terribly. Uh, they become self licking ice cream cones. And as a result of which, we now have probably the worst choice um, between presidential candidates in our entire history as a nation. And that's a that's a, a, a terribly sad thing. I mean, Absolutely. do you vote for Lucifer or do you vote for Satan? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No doubt about it. And that's per, put aptly. Let's uh, let's get to the book, and we're running short on time. Um, first of all, The Damned of Petersburg, and I wanted to talk more about this book, but we kind of got off on Turkey, and I thank you so much about talking about that. Look, when I read this book, you know, this is a Civil War-era book. Um, you've, you've written a number of them. A number of them have gotten awards. Uh, this is The Damned of Petersburg. Um, it's available on Amazon and where other fine books are sold. You know, when I was reading this book, it was just gritty. It was raw. It was, um, you know, a lot That's of times— a lot of times warfare is romanticized. In this book, it did not romanticize it. It got down in the ditches. You know, we're talking about bugs. We're talking about sunburn. We're talking about you're lucky to get rotten food, if any food at all. You're lucky to get dirty water, if any water at all. We're talking about you're lucky if you get dysentery for a week versus a month. You know, this was gritty and raw, and it was, it was just real, and it was some of the best writing. I mean, I read books nonstop, you know, every week. Um, I loved it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of interests in writing these books on the Civil War. and really it's a, it's a quintet of books, of which this is the fourth. They need not be read in order, but this one, The Dam to Petersburg, uh, covers, the, it opens with the, the well, relatively well-known Battle of the Crater in Petersburg, then goes through lesser-known battles like Globe Tavern and Ream Station and Deep Bottom in the fall of 64, building up to re- Lincoln's re-election. And what I'm trying to do and this ties into what we were talking about earlier. I'm trying to give people a way to learn their history that they find palatable, that's uh, entertaining. Mm-hmm. Now, this is technically a novel. These are technically novels, but they're not fictional in the traditional sense. They're extremely accurate history. Right. Uh, the only right. thing that's fictionalized is the, trying to understand the inner thoughts of the character and some of the dialogue. But if you read the books, you're really getting a very accurate, not politically correct version of our Civil War. Because we do, you're absolutely right, too many books, as a soldier, that repulses me when novels uh, romanticize warfare, especially the Civil War. Right. Uh, it was 740,000 Americans died fighting each other. Um, more soldiers died of dysentery, aggravated diarrhea, than died of bullet wounds. And by the 1864, the penultimate year of the war, it is modern war, and it is brutal. It is savage. The romance, the Cavaliers are gone. Right. Uh, it's a, it's a, a death match in those trenches outside of Petersburg, and so I'm just trying to honor the men from our past by taking them down off the the plinth, you know, busting them out of the bronze statues, and showing them as as rounded, complex human beings. I mean, Robert E. Lee was not a marble man; he was incredibly complex. And the more you understand the handicaps under which he operated, his health problems, his his troubled family background, um, the more you respect him. And Grant, Grant is the first modern general. He's not some sort of cartoon drunkard. Mm-hmm. By any means, he's a visionary. And also, though, of course, as a former enlisted man myself, I also try to give you what the, the common soldiers went through. And they're too often left out of the books. But right. at any rate, if you read these books, The Damned of Petersburg and the others, you will understand American history and our Civil War at a level that you know, I, I'm vain enough to say you would not find elsewhere. Yeah, no, I would I would 100%, 100% agree. You get the perspective of, of all of it. And, you know, a war that, you know, tore our country apart and, and that 
you know, outside of the politics of it, you know, those were, that were down on the ground, they didn't necessarily want to be fighting each other. Some of it were, were into it for the hate on maybe on either side for whatever reason, but so many just didn't want to be in it at all. They were killing brethren and kin, you know, friends, family, uh, just a war that almost destroyed our country. And less than 100 years after our founding, we might add, to take on this type of war um, that nearly destroyed us. And this was an amazing book. It was extremely real. Highly recommend for everybody as long as well as the other ones as well. And it also, you know, you kind of get into a little bit of the politics. You know, there's some politics in it as well, that politics in war isn't just something that's a modern thing. It was it occurred back then and even in antiquity as well. Just an amazing book. We're out of time. I wish we had more time. Um, I'd love to have you on the show another time and 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 talk and talk even more i really enjoyed it well thank you so much uh colonel thank you so much for being on the show much appreciated lieutenant colonel ralph peters author of the dan 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 peters author